My name is Alan, lead pastor at Life Church for all of you who are guests, and I'm so grateful that all of you who are guests are here today. Uh, we are closing out this series called Bless, and this has been a very, very powerful series. The bottom line of this series is God wants us to bless others because God has blessed us. Uh, that is our call. That's who we have been created or what we've been created to do is to be a blessing because he has overwhelmingly blessed us in ways that we don't really understand and we will only fully understand when we stand before God and we experience the totality of his grace towards us. His grace towards us that he's poured, he lavished his grace on a person like me and called me to be a proclaimer of his word. God has blessed me and he's blessed you and he's called you and I to be blessings. So this is what we're talking about. We've been trying to encourage you and we've been looking at practices, practices that Jesus did in order to bless other people. Whenever he blessed people in order to bring them to the Father, he did five crucial things. Number one, he began with prayer. And we are to begin with prayer. We can't do anything unless we first pray. I mean, I, you, you can't uh, lead a person to Christ unless you are actually praying for that person's heart. Uh, he also listened with care. We saw that he didn't just bust up into people's lives and, and come with all the answers. That's not what he did. He really listened. He keyed in, listened as a student, wanted to know what that person or who that person is so that he can meet their needs. He also ate together. We talked about eating together. And we saw through scripture that, that, that Jesus would take so many opportunities and throughout the gospels, he was always found sitting down and chomping and eating. Because in that, that, that meal, there was some type of um, uh, a, a fellowship of the spirit. It was some, a beautiful moment. Whenever he ate, people became transparent and they began to share their heart. And that's what happens when we eat with people because they know that we uh, care about them and we see them as worthwhile. And then uh, last week, Josh talked about serving with love. And he hit that ball out the park. Serving with love. Because the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give him his life a, a ransom for many. And so then he says, I send you to serve, not to be served. It's not about me, 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 me. It's about how can I um, advance the kingdom of God by loving someone else and serving. And then we're sharing our story. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, sharing our story. Uh, this is a really important Part because I think that this is the, 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 the logical conclusion of everything that we've done. If we practice all of those things, then we can then share our story. Then we can have an open door when we've built these relationships and practice these things. We've opened a door to share our story. And because you got to understand, there's, there's an issue here. See, if you think that all you can do, should do is to go up to a person and start preaching to them or preaching at them, you're not going to make a change. One person actually said that. He says, instruction without relationship rarely leads to change. That person goes on to talk about the fact that uh, discipleship without relationship is Phariseeism. It's, in other words, for discipleship, trying to disciple or train or teach and instruct another person without building that type of relationship, that listening relationship, that eating together relationship, that prayerful relationship. When we do that, then we become simply moral police. Moral police. No one wants to hear a message from you if you don't know me. If you really don't care about me. I mean, you know, I've had people do that. Uh, people who, who don't know me called me to, to instruct me. I remember one specific day, a person called me because they felt that I was teaching something wrong and called me up and told me and tried to get me straight. <laughs> and I said, when was the last time we went out for, for coffee? 
When was the last time we have actually sat down and talked? You don't have that type of relational equity. You see what I'm saying? You don't have that. Now, 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 now let me say, I, th- that does not mean that we, can't, we only have, re- uh, have to have these established relationships because sometimes you are on a plane and you're sharing with someone that you don't know and you can share the good news of Jesus Christ. But even in that situation, we need to practice some of these principles like praying, like listening, like acting like, or not acting, but, but actually caring. So we're going to talk about sharing our story today. But, 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 but this whole in, issue about sharing our story is not that simple. Because it's really not just about our story as we're going to talk about today. We're going to answer a question. This is just one simple question. That is, how can we share our story in the most effective way? And this is what I really care about. I care that it is important for us as Christians, we've been called to share our story, but we have to do it in an effective way. We have to do it in a transformative way. We have to do it in a way that causes change. And we're going to see how we can do that in one passage. So I want you to really lean in and to to listen uh, closely because there are three, I think, effective ways that we share our story in order to change another person's life. So uh, before I get into it, I want you to pray with me. Let's pray and agree with me in my uh, prayer for my mom and uh, for others. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you that you are here today. I thank you so much. Every time I stand in front of people, I thank you that you have forgiven me of all my sins. And Father, through the cross of Christ, you've forgiven all of us. I thank you for that. I'm praying, Father, that you give me ability to speak, that you would heal me as I talk, or just give me strength to get through this today. I pray for my mom, and I pray that you will raise her up. We all as a family agree that you would raise her up, God, and your hand would be on her. God, that she would even feel a sense of your presence. I pray for anyone who's here that's sick or their family loved one is sick, and I'm just asking. I don't have to know their names, but I'm asking, Father, that you would be with them. I pray that you will help us today to hear so that we can be a blessing in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so whenever I cough... Whoever's doing my sound, pipe it down. I'm about to cough. (coughs) You didn't do it. I knew it was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen. So we're talking about sharing our story and how can we share our story effectively. And I think that there are three clear ways that we can be effective in sharing our story so that people would be blessed. And those ways are found in 1 Peter chapter 3. And it's a beautiful uh, letter that Peter wrote. If you know anything about Peter, you know that he studied uh, Jesus Christ, that he walked with Jesus, and he studied his every move. He saw everything Jesus did in in Jesus' mission to bring people to the Father. He studied them. And when you read his letter, he often refers to things that Jesus said. And in in the book of 1 Peter, uh, it it was a book that he wrote to people to encourage them how to live in the marketplace, how to live around people who do not uh, agree with you and don't believe in your Savior. How are you to live? And in chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, he, I believe, gives us ways that we are to be effective in our, sh- in our storytelling or sh- uh, sharing our story. It's not just our personal story, as you will see in this passage. It starts in verse 13 through 15 of chapter 3. He says, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ 
as Lord. So he's talking about people who are in the marketplace, who are in an, a hostile situation where uh, the, the, the people on the outside or the people who are not believers in Jesus Christ were persecuting them or mistreating them or just simply talking about them. And he talked about something that's very, very interesting. He's really talking about how they can initially share their story. They share their story and here it is through a lifestyle surrendered to Jesus. You know, you share your story. Now, what? Now, how do you see that in that passage? Because he says that in the midst of these tough times or in the midst of this, these, this, these persecutors, uh, what you are to do is you are to slow down and you're going to uh, make sure that Jesus is on the throne of your heart and you are going to dictate your life or live your life in uh, understanding the presence of Jesus. You set him apart. He is there no matter what happens to you in your life. No matter what you go through, uh, God has called us to surrender our life or to make sure we set apart Christ as Lord. He is the invisible Lord who is directing my affairs and I'm not going to be swayed by other people's uh, things that they do towards me. I believe in this passage he's talking about uh, when he says for that, that, that we are to uh, uh, set apart Christ in our heart. I believe that he's talking about the story arc of our life. Paul says it this way, and many of you know of this passage. When he was writing to, to the Corinthians, he says this. He says, you yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. Your life, you have to understand, a story is not a story until it is read. And people are reading you wherever you go, the, it, while you are at your job or while you're in your family or while you're in your neighborhood or even when you're at your church that you are being read. You have a story and your story is being told. The question is, what is your story? He says that people are, are looking at you. Paul says that, that people are, are reading you. Everything we do, we're being read. And the question is, what is your story? Is your story the story of a person who is surrendered, who has surrendered their lives to the lordship of Jesus Christ so that whenever you go through anything and, and what, 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 you, what you do is you submit to the fact that he is on the throne? Do you do this in your home? Do you do this at your job? Do you do this in your neighborhood? Do you do, do this with your friends? Are you surrendering your life? Because that is a story that we are telling. The story of our life. The second thing I think is in this same uh, passage, and I'm going to add to that passage. It goes on to say, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be threatened, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. And it goes on to say this. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. There's another thing I think that we do. I think that, 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 that shares our story. Not only does our life surrender to Jesus speak or share a story, story, but this other one is this, responding Christ-like in tough times. See, this is what he's talking about. He says, look, he says, people are, uh, are, you are going through things. You are going through persecution. Peter is talking to his, his church. And he says, people are actually looking at you and they are waiting to see how you respond in that tough time. That's exactly what he's saying. He says, that's why they're asking, what is the hope that you have? They're looking at you and saying, why in the world are you going through this? Why, why are you still serving Christ and loving people in this economic downturn? 
Why, why are you actually uh, serving Christ and doing well uh, when you are going, uh, when you have lost your job or your spouse has walked out or you've lost a loved one or you have chronic pain? Why are you still doing this? Because they are looking at you. I remember years ago when I was doing a radio show, um, uh, I, I did a show here in Detroit in the early 90s when there was a, a catastrophic, strophic, wait, catastrophic, Lord have mercy. mercy. <laughs> well, you take as many drugs as I did last night. The fact that I even said catastrophic is amazing. Uh, it was an earthquake. Er, earthquake. <laughs> See, you know what though? Was, what's funny though, what's really funny is that you who call yourselves people who love me, you are, you are actually laughing at my disability. It's really kind of interesting, but it, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> so so there, there was an earthquake and uh, I was doing a radio and I interviewed a person who was on the ground. And so I wanted to get uh, a feed of, uh, so I called this person who was a reporter who was on the ground and uh, he was talking about what was going on and, and the, re the reactions of people. And then off the record, he began to talk about a person who was in his apartment complex. He says, there was this guy who was the, the apartment preacher and he used to go around every day and he's always preaching about the fact that he doesn't care about dying. He can't wait to see the Lord. He's waiting for the Lord to come. And he was always talking about how, you know, he's not afraid of anything. He's this fearless preacher. And so he, he says, but it was really interesting because when the, I saw when the earthquake hit, I was right there. And this guy ran out. Ah! Ah! Hey, save me! I mean, this really... Now I'm telling you, and when he told me that, and so again, let me say this, I don't want to judge that person because I don't know what I would do. You know, I don't want to judge that person, but, but the moral of the story is this. The moral of the story is people are looking at your response in tough times. And so this guy who was, was the reporter was not a believer. And so he heard this apartment preacher every day and he keyed on that person. Yeah, there were hundreds of other people who were screaming, but he, was, he just keyed on that one person and said, oh yeah, 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 that's what you, you say that you believe, you don't care about dying, really? You know, people got to understand that we share our story and this is a beautiful story when we go through very, very difficult times and we respond in a Christ-like manner. See, we gotta understand. I mean, people are actually looking at us. I remember working at a, at a, at a, a school. I used to talk about uh, the, the, the middle school in Detroit that I worked at and, and, and I did a lot of stupid things that I still regret. But it's so funny that I remember when things would just pop off, you know, it could be a fight or something going on. I remember seeing kids going like this. <laughs> They're just watching to see if I was about to turn up. And I did. I know. I told you, I, I've been praying for my, I have regret. But, it's serious because as I shared with you before, there was one person I shared Christ and the person said to me, I don't believe that you're a Christian because of something that they saw. I'm glad this is a long time ago and I had, you know, God is so merciful that he gives us a second chance to be Christ-like. Uh, but, but he, you know, um, he also, we also have to respond in our home. You wonder why children uh, grow up and then they become teenagers and then they decide not to go to church. I'm going to say something. It's, please, please understand. I'm saying this in love. But a lot of, a lot of teens and a lot of uh, young people have decided to walk away from church. It's because they never saw the reality of Jesus in the tough times in their parents' lives. I mean, they, they, they just act like everyone else. They're cussing and stuff while they're driving to church. 
I'm telling you, this is the truth. And so, they, and so they have to go to church while they're living in that house. But then when they get out, they are gone. And many of them uh, become a part of what they call the new atheists. They just become, they, they, they don't even believe in God anymore because they never saw the, 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 the genuineness and the authenticity of Christianity or Christ in the lives of their parents. It's, imp- it's so important for all of us. And it's not just parents. I mean, even churches. People are walking out of churches because, uh, they, because of what they call hypocrisy. But it's true. I mean, we raise our hands in church, but when we, uh, when we have some type of tough times, we just have this default button and we go back to the person that we used to be. In many cases, we've never left the person that we used to be. So, so I think that we share our story by surrendering our life to Jesus Christ, but we also share our story. It's so, so important when we respond in a Christ-like manner in tough times. All of us, not just you. I'm not pointing at you, me. Some of you looking at me when I see things mess up at church. You looking at me uh, when I when I when the when the. Uh, I remember we had a lunch. I'll just talk too much. We had a lunch. We had a lunch uh, that that uh, one of our lunches, and it wasn't organized well. And I came running in, running, and you know, I, I, you know, micromanaging and stuff like that. And people already know. You say that's Alan anyway. No, I don't do it all the time, but I did, and I had people talk about me. He's supposed to be a pastor. He's supposed to have some peace. I want you to know that that person was telling the truth. We all have to respond properly in a Christ-like manner in tough times because we are sharing a story. Our lives are saying that you are a believer or you're not. I trust in Jesus or I don't. The final one. The final one is uh, in verses 15 again, and I'm going to read that again. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. The word reason is an interesting word. In the original text, it was written in Greek. The word is apologia, which uh, we get this word apologetics from, and it actually means defense or explanation. And so what uh, Peter is saying is that, look, I, it just, t- just sharing your story is not the thing that you, that what people want to know, it's not that you just simply say that uh, God has blessed me, but people want to know why. They got to get some explanation. You, you got to defend this thing. And what am, I, what am I saying? See, see uh, it's not, transforming a life is not just your personal story. Amen. And please, hear what I'm saying, hear what I'm saying. And I have a couple of things that I'm going to talk about with, with regard to that. Uh, some of us may say something like this. I found peace like no other. And then I would simply say, when we say, I found peace like no other, the next slide there you go. <laughs> Hindus, Hindus claim that. H- hear me. Hear me. When you say, I found peace. Well, if that's all you got to say, you have to understand that um, uh, someone who follows uh, the Hindu religion will say, I have peace too. And sometimes when you walk up to them, it seems like they're more peaceful than you. I mean, there are all types of um, um, competing claims around. I've become so much more disciplined when I came to Christ. Well, Islam can take credit for that. You see, you got to listen to me, listen to me. See, it's, it's not just your personal story because your personal story can be challenged. You see, so, so you say, then I have not, I am a lot more disciplined when I came to Christ. And so someone in Islam will say, well, look at, we got an army of people that are disciplined. Discipline ain't, ain't the story. You got to give me something more than that. Uh, see, see, you got to understand that every other belief system has a story to counteract yours. 
They, they, they do. You got to understand. Don't think that everyone just believes uh, in the same thing. You know, you know, everyone has a story that they believe that they are right and you are wrong. So you might say something like, I've become a student of the Bible. Well, you got to understand, Jehovah's Witness claim that. Yeah, yeah, see, see, it's not just your personal story of, of your experiences or God has pr- provided for you or you have had mir- miracles. You got to tell something more. It's, uh, I finally found my identity. You got to understand, Hebrew Israelites claim that. You say, who are Hebrew Israelites? Well, they're now called, some call them the black Hebrew Israelites. I don't know if you heard about them. And they say they find their identity in the 12 tribes of Israel and the one tribe, Judah, that they are the original tribe of Judah. Some of you have heard of it. Some people in Life Church have left Life Church and followed them. And so they believe that their identity is found in that. And so the reason why it's not just a black Hebrew, but it's a uh, people of color Hebrew Hebrew Israelites is because they go through all 12 tribes children of Israel and they say each of them represent one people one person of color so you could have the Native Americans and they could be from the 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 tribe of Dan or you can have the Hispanics and they're from the tribe of Issachar and then they say that Caucasians or Europeans are called Edomites and they're come from Esau and Esau was cursed and God hates them Yes, but he loves the 12 tribes. And it's, and it's identity uh, religion, and it, it appeals to people who feel that they have been out, marginalized or an outcast or they have been victims of, uh, of racism and discrimination, which, are, which is true. These things happen in this, in this country, but they get people who feel like they are, they, that, they have, that they have been uh, discriminated from and they bring them into this, this group and then they, they, they make them believe that they they are come from the tribe of Judah. And so uh, Israel, those Israelites that you see, those who are in Israel are not true Jews, they say. They're, they're imposters. Okay, so, so, so why, am I, I, why am I even saying that? It's very important for you to know. It's very important for you to realize that when you come to a person with just your personal story, you got to understand that your story can be attacked. So you need to be able to be, you need to be prepared with his story. And this was the point. And this is why they did not put that next slide up because I missed the point and it was really my fault. So I want to go back to the point and that is our story could be duplicated. And I don't know if that's the point that I had. Where's the point? (laughs) Incorporate his story with our story. If we're going to share our story, we need to incorporate his story with our story. Our stories are, God has changed my life. He's healed my heart. But I need to, I need to say something more because they, because our story could be duplicated. And so what am I talking about? Incorporating his story with our story. Let me say this. One part of his story that you need to incorporate when you share your story is you need to tell people that Jesus is God himself. You got to do that. You have to stand up and say he's the second person of the Trinity. He is God himself. Why? Because every time you do that, you dismantle the Jehovah's Witness who will tell you that you are a liar because Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Every time you do that, you dismantle the Mormons who will say that Jesus is just one of many gods. Every time you do that, you dismantle Islam that says that Jesus Christ is only a prophet. You got you, you to say something more. 
He, 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 that's why Paul wrote this, and, he, and you need to put this in your memory bank, and that is, Paul says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the of glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's who he is. Jesus says, You'll not, you won't have life unless you know that I am. That's what he said. That you know I am. I am the a- I am. Okay. We need to know that our, our rebellion separate, separated me from God. You guys got to know something about who we are. When you, when you share your story, you need, to, you need to talk about the fact, and I do it often, that I was rebellious and that my rebellion separated me from God to the extent that I was shut, but that, that, that I was uh, cut off from the life of God. My sin shut me up to the extent that I did not have any power to get out of my sin. Do you realize that, that's, that that is the whole, the, 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 the beauty of the gospel, that gospel comes with grace and gets me out of my sin. But you need to know that our rebellion separates us from God. The prophet Habakkuk says, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. The next thing you need to know about his story is on the cross, our savior took away the punishment of our rebellion. See, you, you got to understand on the cross. When you say that, when you, when you share with people that Jesus died on the cross and he took my place, he, 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 he took away the punishment that because of my sin, I was uh, heading toward, toward eternal death. But on the cross, he took away my sin. When you do that, you dismantle Islam who teaches that Jesus Christ did not die on the cross. You got to understand. You dismantle Islam. The other thing is, our Savior rose bodily from the grave because death could not hold a perfect man. When I say perfect man, he is 100% God, 100% man. And Acts tells us that because of the fact that he was perfect, his resurrection validated everything he did and everything he was. Death could not hold him. But the reason why it's important for us to say that Jesus grows bodily, some of you know, is because uh, Jehovah's Witness believe that he grows as a ghost as a spirit. And yet, don't you remember Jesus talking to the disciples and saying, look, why don't you handle me? Uh, look at me. I, I, I have flesh and bones. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you know of any ghost that has flesh and bones? <coughs> Excuse me. And the final one is, by grace, you are saved through faith. By grace, you are saved through faith. The reason why it's important for you to incorporate that story is because you got to understand that Islam does not believe in grace. Do you realize that? They say, first of all, they don't understand the cross. They don't understand, they don't understand uh, about a savior that's dying on the cross. They don't understand grace. And they say that when you stand before God in order to get to paradise, your good deeds have to outweigh your bad deeds. No. <clears throat> that is what scripture says. Scripture says that unmerited favor is what got me. Jesus Christ said that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He came and chased me when I was re- raising my fist against him, when I was cussing him. Jesus still comes chasing after you, even after you have gone to Jesus Christ. He's always chasing after you. Every time you're going through sin, every time you're going through problems, Jesus is chasing you. Is, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> hold on. I'm about to go. Okay. I, don't, I might drop this because I might start running. <clears throat> By grace, are you saved? What does it mean? <clears throat> it's not a meritocracy. Uh, see, uh, among, among Islam, it's a meritocracy. <clears throat> you have to be good enough. And you get saved. No man is good. 
No woman is good. No one is righteous. No one seeks after me. He says, I looked down and I saw that there was no savior. I looked down and saw that there was no righteousness. Therefore, through my own arm, I reached out and I grabbed them. I don't wait for them to get good. I sent Jesus Christ to be good on their behalf. By grace, are you saved? Not just our personal story. Our personal story. I can say, God, you healed me from my heart condition. You know, they'll come, they'll they'll listen to that and say, yeah, well, it's probably because, um, well, maybe you just stopped drinking or uh, maybe you just stopped wilding out. Excuse me. I had to say, no, 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 no. It really wasn't about my physical heart condition. It was about the fact that I had a stony heart. And through his grace, he gave me a new heart. And he's God and God himself. And he died on the cross and he rose bodily from the grave and he's coming back again. Share your story. This has been a tough... Now, you're looking at me like, boy, that guy got some problems. And I'm sweating like a pig up here. As the band comes out, closing out this series, we all must share our story. In order to be a blessing to other people, all of these practices need to be worked together from prayer to listening to, eating together and serving and now sharing. But if we're gonna be effective in the way that we share, we have to make sure that we are living our lives because our lives are a book. You gotta realize that people are reading you and your lives will tell us whether you have faith in the invisible Christ who sits on the throne of your heart or you don't. You got to respond properly to your trials. And finally, you have to incorporate his story with yours because our story is incomplete if we don't incorporate the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we don't incorporate the fact that Jesus is God, that he died on the cross, that he rose again, that he is coming back, that we are sinners, that we needed his grace, if we don't incorporate that, then our story is not only incomplete, but is not effective. So I would just share this with you as a takeaway for some of you. I would love for you to share your story. In order to do that, and please forgive me, but in order to do that, I encourage you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. To live a life of surrender. In order to do that, I'm encouraging encouraging you to respond in a Christ-like way in your tough times. But finally, I want you to incorporate his story into your story. And how can you do that? These These are two things I want you to think about and be serious about because if you're going to bless other people with the good news of Jesus you have to incorporate his story into your story to be effective number one I want you to write down your story that was something that we did I did in seminary that was so helpful is that we wrote down our story just wrote down just you need to think about it's, it's important for you to be able to identify your story when Jesus came to your, in your life. Do you, do you remember those, that day? 
Do you remember that day when someone was talking to you about Jesus Christ and finally maybe you gone to church and you heard a, a, a message and you responded? I remember that day when I was just simply driving and I uh, just stopped and started screaming out and calling out in the name of Jesus at 17. Do you actually remember that day? Sometimes you need to write down your story. Oftentimes you, you might write down the key elements of the story, how it, uh, what, what brought you to Christ and, and then what brought you to become a follower, a full, fully devoted follower of Christ. Write down your story, please. It's, it, it will really bless you. But now you have to incorporate God's story into your story. And some of you, some of you um, may not have all of that uh, information in your head. And I understand that. I understand that. But God says, Paul says that we need to be students. Study to show yourself approved to God. A workman or work person that needs not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. He wants us to study. So not only write your story, but join a small group. You know, some of you, some of you haven't done it and you've been going to church, our church for a long time and the only time that you've gotten the word is on Sunday. But these, the small groups, not only are they good for relationships, but they're also good to, to be able to defend your faith. <clears throat> we have one coming up, in, in, uh, two coming up in January. The 10th of January, on a Wednesday, we have our cult apologetics group that's be led by the director of our counseling services and our ordained minister, uh, Elrita Dodds. And she's out here, right here. And she has, she's, you, yeah, you need, to, you need to get in that class. She's done it so many times. She's had so many people at our church. It's so important. It's so important. And people have been so encouraged and blessed by it. We have a little sign-up sheet down out there and you can sign up if you want to be a part of that in January, January 10th. And the, and the other one is the one that I'm doing. I've been do, going through the book of Revelation. I'm coming back. We've had a hiatus because of, we had so many other things happening. But I've been going through the book of Revelation and I'll be starting on January 10th as well. So those sign-up sheets are out there. <clears throat> and if... And if you make a decision that you're surrendering your life and you want your life to, to tell a story and, you, and, and it causes you to respond properly during times of trial and you begin to build yourself up in the truth of scripture and if you begin to share the story and incorporate his story, I guarantee you this, that that friend, that neighbor, that relative that you've been talking to will come to Christ and will begin to have their lives transformed because you're not just talking about you, but you're talking about the one who saved you. Your story is important, and I'm not going to in any way minimize that. I got that. Your story is important, but it is incomplete if you don't let people know who is the one who saved you. It's Jesus, God, Lord, King, and man. And when you do that, my goodness gracious, you'll see some joy in their hearts. And there will be joy in heaven. So the final question I want you to chew on as we close is what story do you want to tell? <laughs>